on. The microphone is fixed, so hopefully you can hear me in the back without me having to scream. Um, we have a lot to get through today because we didn't get very far in the design process, really not even to specification development. So we have a lot to cover for this, uh, or today, talking about design. If we don't finish it, we'll do a little bit at the beginning of the ethics lecture. So there's one more lecture in the intro series. If you're a one credit hour student, you have one more lecture that you need to go to for epics. Um, and then you also need to do the ethics um, survey, which is on the little sheet. But we'll talk about that at the end. So we're going to talk, as I said, we're going to try and get through quite a bit of the design process today. And um, really be thinking about how you might utilize these um, in your projects and at least aware of some of the tools that you can use if you're not at that part in the design process right now. So specifications, your homework was to look and see if your project has some specifications. So who could find a really good set of specifications for their project? Yeah, see that's part of the problem. Really being able to have this specification, this is something that really needs to ground your design. Um, once you understand your requirements, really getting a good set of specifications. So I would challenge you to maybe talk to your team and, and make sure that this is something um, that you go back and revisit and continue to develop. Um, I can tell you, you have design reviews in two weeks. Reviewers want to know what are your goals, what are the specs that you're designing to and for. Because how can you know if your design is successful if you don't know what the specs are? So it will come up again and again if your team hasn't already addressed it. So highly recommend that you take a look and do and developing this, uh, finding them, and making sure that you're continuing to design to them. Because we've had teams have actually developed really good specs and then future teams don't realize they're there or forget about them. So when we talk about design specifications, and I use customer requirements and design specifications a little bit interchangeably, but usually when we're talking about design specs, these are measurable um, and testable. So in addition to figuring out what your project needs to be able to do, early in the design you should be thinking about how will I know if it achieves that. So some things are easy. You can maybe weigh something if it has to have a certain weight. But there are other aspects related to the design that you actually might have to design in, um, hooks into your design to be able to actually measure some of these requirements. So thinking about this early is actually something that's very useful in design. You don't want to think about testing only at the end. You actually want to think about testing early on. So how will I know I'm successful? Um, these need to be objective. So often our community partners say, I want something light. But probably what's light for you is not light for everybody else. So what does that mean? Is that 5 pounds, 10 pounds, 20 pounds? What is light? So really having it be measurable. And have some set of units, of course, associated with that. When we think about specifications or requirements, not only are some functional or maybe physical kinds of specifications, but there's actually a number of categories that we might want to think about. So are there some environmental specifications? Does it have to be uh, less than a certain um, decibel, decibel as far as a sound? It, or is it too loud? Um, what kind of other um, energy can it use uh, requirements for that. So you can actually look at all of these different criteria and identify specifications and or requirements that um, your project needs to have to be able to, to meet them. Economic, any kind of legal 
Are there any kind of FCC leg, um, regulations that it has to meet? Can it only be within uh, a certain frequency of transmission? What are some of those things that um, are requirements of your projects? And so really looking at all of these things. Too often it's just maybe basic functionality that we focus on the specification, but it's all of these criteria that make our projects successful. So looking at those different categories. Um, as an example, and this is an older example, so prior to that handheld device, that her device that I talked about, um, where we developed the personas and the scenarios, we had a, a, a communication device where there were basically, it had four slots. And kids could communicate by either putting the card into the slot or take it out and it would say the corresponding sound that was on the card. Well, on the market, they already had one of these, but they programmed it specifically to, so I would program slot one to say banana, no matter what. So if I accidentally put the wrong card in there, then my kids with disabilities would learn the wrong thing. And one of the things that's harder than teaching a child with a disability, something is unteaching something wrong after you've already taught it to them wrong. So having it be accurate was actually really, really critical. So we were working on designing a device that we could um, basically, the sound depended on the card, not the location in this four um, slot device. So we started to, started with this basic goal. We wanted to teach communication. We knew what was out there as far as what the typical length of messages were, how many were typically, cards were typically on devices that were available. So we identified we wanted to be able to do four cards and that we wanted to be able to have up to 15, four cards on the slots, but 15 different cards that we could use at any one time. Once we decided that, then we started to identify still more specifications. So as we decided and figured out how long the messages needed to be, that actually had implications for the amount of memory we needed for the microprocessor that we were using for this. Um, the number of cards, as I said, we determined. Um, we needed to be able to have it identify both when we put the card in and took the card out. That had design implications. So as we started identifying these different specifications, it started to have implications for the design. As I said, we already looked at what was available, and you want to do this for a couple of different reasons. We didn't need to design something that was already available that the school could just purchase. Um, we wanted to design something unique and that had an act, uh, additional benefit. The other thing is you don't want to infringe on other people's IP, uh, intellectual property, and or you want to maybe see if there's an opportunity for you to patent this device and maybe potentially find uh, a niche in the market where the product can be. So really, you want to first identify, is there something that this project needs to do that's not out there? And what we identified for ours is that, and it's still the case, that it's tied to the um, slot and not to the card uh, related to that. Um, one of the ways to organize your specs is to put them in a table. So maybe they're kind of in, interspersed between your, in your design document, but you actually want to list what that spec or requirement is and where the origin is. And then how will you know if you will achieve it? What kind of testing can you do for that? And then you can use this as a a uh, table that you can track what are all the specs you can show we've met all of these specs. One of the reasons why origin is important is that sometimes uh, a motivating factor for a spec changes. Maybe it's a regulation, maybe it's a particular person in the organization, and so you just want to make sure you know why you're doing something, because often we find ourselves doing something and we don't know why we're still doing it. And so if you can at least track who the, if I can manage to get through this lecture without tripping myself, that'll be a miracle. But 
Um, as far as you want to make sure that you know why you're doing it and where that came from. Because if regulations change or whatever for that. So for example, we started to identify more specific requirements. So it needed to play a sound, but how loud of a sound? Well, we identified what the range needed to be in decibels within the classroom. Um, you know, variable output. We just started to um, fill out our spec uh, table and continue to iterate this as we went along with that. Another example of specifications, um, this is from a Mars rover project as far as if you want to look at more functional kinds of uh, requirements that you could identify a number of requirements as well. So here's just another example of um, lists of specifications that you should have for your project. So if you don't have something like this or the table before, you should really look at doing that. So again, uh, the goal, we really haven't talked about how we're doing any of this, do, have we yet? We know what it needs to do, but we still haven't gotten to how we're going to do it. But the end of this, the specification phase, you really want to at least have criteria, measurable criteria of what your project needs to do, looking at all those different categories. So then the next phase is the conceptual. And this is where we start to explore. And we actually then, by the end, have um, a method moving forward of how we're actually going to accomplish our project. So this is a time in the design space that we open up the possibilities and really think of a lot of different ways that we can achieve it and then narrow and make a decision um, on one of those things. Um, research has shown that the more ideas you have during some of the conceptual, the better the quality of the product. So this is something that it's important to spend enough time doing so that you can actually have the best solution possible. Because sometimes, this is us, and we're thinking, oh, we have this project idea. Our project partner wants us to build something. And we have come up with an idea in our space. But the idea of the optimal is often way out here. So how can we expand the design space the solution space to include the optimal solution. So there's a lot of different strategies in achieving this. One of these is a functional decomposition. So what we can do is instead of still now we're at the what our project needs to do, we can break it down and look at each part, each function separately and brainstorm on those and then see if there's a creative way that we can integrate all of those. So for the functional decomposition, for example, our talkie board with the four slots, we started to identify then what were the things that it needed to be able to do. So we had, for example, it needed to identify the cards. Um, it needed to have some kind of user interface. We had to be able to choose between the different modes and some way to be able to record and play messages. But we haven't yet quite decided how we're doing all of these, but we started to then identify. So then you can brainstorm for each of these sub-functions, like my, what might be different ways to identify specific cards in our system. What might you think of? A barcode, yep. RFID, um, kind of like a barcode, but like a, um, a bit pattern that represents the different. So you could brainstorm a whole bunch of different ways to do this and then bring it back all together um, in your design. So this is one tool for brainstorming. Another is Scamper. Have you seen Scamper before? And so it's um, mnemonic to represent variations that you might make on your design. 
So often an optimal design is either some combination of different ideas or variation of things that we already knew, know. So draw from other analogies that you can see around you and then see how you might modify them to come up with something that's innovative. So substitute, combine, adapt other things. You maybe see it used in one context, use it in, in another context, in your context. Either make something larger, smaller, the magnify. Um, put to other uses. So again, can you have maybe something serve multiple uses um, within your project? Eliminate, are there things you can actually get rid of and reverse and rearrange? So these can be mnemonics that once you have some solutions, you can actually brainstorm. So if you were, when you were doing the wallet exercise, if you came up with an original idea, you could actually then do, you know, ideate more by actually using these words to think, okay, I can't come up with another one, let me just reverse it, what does it look like? That could be a brainstorming uh, tool for like what you did in the, the wallet. Another way, um, it's called 635, and those numbers are somewhat arbitrary, but um, if you have a group of six people, everybody has a piece of paper, and you write down three ideas, and then you pass the sheet around in the circle until everybody has a chance. And when it, you get the paper, you read all the previous ideas and either add on a new idea or extend one of the ones that are already there. One of the advantages of this kind of brainstorming technique is that everybody has a voice. So if you're working at a team where maybe there's, um, you know, not everybody is uh, very outgoing or, or you know, uh, afraid to share their ideas, this is actually a really good way to get everybody to participate um, because you're just, it's kind of anonymous and, you, and you're not getting that negative feedback you sometimes get in brainstorming that you're not supposed to do, um, not evaluate the ideas at that time, but just get more ideas. Um, this is actually really good for that. So this is a strategy. Another strategy is using these cards, and these are kind of like scamper, so these are design heuristic cards. Um, a group of researchers studied an industrial design um, expert professional and identified 77 different design strategies that um, he used in his work. And so one of the really neat things about this is it gives you not only the example for this one is so using it in a new way, it also then shows some commercial products that have actually implemented these ideas. So we have a couple of sets of these cards. So if your team is at that brainstorming phase and needs to get some kind of inspiration, these cards are really effective at helping with ideation. Um, so just one of these other triggers in the brainstorming. So talked briefly about ways to expand that space, but part of the conceptual design, and you probably want at least three different <coughs> conceptual design ideas that you come up with. So not just one, when you're brainstorming, at least three, if not five to seven, is really a, a target that you want to do with that. But at some point you actually need to then decide which one of those is the best conceptual design to move forward to go to detailed design. So um, after you've figured out what it is you need, then you need to converge. So one of the tools that we use um, is a decision matrix. How many are familiar with the decision matrix? Okay, fair number, great. So one of the things that's important here, what do you think, um, well, it's, it's a tool to help you quantify aspects of your uh, a decision that you need to make, okay? Um, one of the things, so you list all your alternatives and you'll quantify those. Uh, these are great things to share in design reviews. So if you've made a decision about something in your design, you can do that. So for the example here, you have your criteria for comparison 
And we most often use a weighted one so that each criteria is weighted differently and then you'll have the number of ideas to be scored. What do you think should be the criteria for comparison? Yes? Your specifications, that's right. Because if it's what your project is supposed to do, that's how you should evaluate your conceptual ideas. Okay, so if you have specifications, or all the specifications, and you may have some additional things here, but if they come up in your decision matrix as important, they probably need to be reflected in your specifications. So that's how you should be making a decision related to that. Here's an example, and many of you have already seen this, but the way that we do that, we've waited so this is a decision matrix to try and decide which job you might want to take. Some of you have, are in that process right now. Some of you have already decided. Some of you that may be a little ways off. But maybe you've identified these are the criteria I'm going to use to make that decision. And you've waited. The most important is location, salaries fourth. And you have four different job offers that you're considering. So you wait each of your companies based on those criteria, and then you multiply the weight by the score that it gets and add them up until you get the score on the bottom. So those of you who've used these before, um, which, what kind of information can you, or conclusions can you draw from this decision matrix? Do we absolutely go, looks like A1, as far as that. What do you need to do when you have a decision matrix, if you do this? Can we really say A is that much better than B? No, right? We can probably say D probably isn't the top. We can probably make some di distinguishing factor. If I had a product where I got to this point, I would want to look and see, are there other criteria I need to consider in making my decision that wasn't reflected to make sure that this makes sense? You also want to do that sanity check to make sure that the way that it was scored um, really actually makes sense with that. But it can help in distinguishing those you probably want to invest more time in, A and B, and maybe those that you don't. C and D are li unlikely to be the ones. Okay. So we're quickly to detailed design phase. And actually, this part gets a little tricky because this becomes very discipline specific. It's hard to talk about a ton of different strategies that are going to apply to the different projects because at this point, it's very discipline specific or project specific. There are a few things, uh, strategies that are effective. The first one in talking about freezing um, the interfaces. Who knows what freezing, what, what I mean by freezing the interfaces for that. So if you have uh, multiple subsystems, either software or hardware, you come to an agreement on how those are going to interact how the mechanical things are going to, so at least maybe the, the surface in which to, how the motor is going to mount. So there may be other aspects of that you don't, haven't decided, but you agree on where the interfaces are. And then that way the subsystems can operate independently um, in, in their design and their development. For software, you might decide which variables are, are what, kind of information is being communicated between um, different um, sub-functions of the project. Um, so those are things that you want to be able to do. In software, it was top-down specification, bottom-up implementation. Then you would actually then start coding um, the underlying software or, or programs that went underneath that. So do that will help your team be most effective and getting the, the project done. 
The other thing is a DFMEA, and we'll, I'll show you that in just a minute. Again, continuing to prototype different aspects. So prototyping is not just something we do in specification or even in conceptual. You can actually, there's those little iterations of brainstorming and figuring out aspects of your project where you can use those same kind of strategies to show that it's actually going to work um, and um, how the subcomponents are all going to fit together. And then eventually getting to the later edges of field testing um, and usability testing. But again, those are still things you can do along the way. Um, often, it's recommended even that you can write the user's manual before you actually finish your project because that will actually help with the specification development um, and it certainly can help maybe with some testing or usability uh, things that you have found out with that. So this is really getting into, of course, as it suggests, the details of how you're going to implement um, the conceptual project that you can do. So this is a DFMEA, so it's de Design for Failure Mode Effects Analysis. So the failure mode effects analysis, that actually this strategy can be used in a variety of different contexts. This one is related to design, but it actually can be used in project management for risk analysis for your, uh, what aspects of your project are most likely to not stay on schedule. Um, so there, there's lots of contexts that this is used, but we're going to talk about it in design. And what you do with a DFMEA is you identify what are the potential failures. Because the goal here is not to wait until you're done or it fails to actually address it. Can you, in your design, anticipate failures and design in um, safeguards or mitigate those risks in your design? So you can identify those potential failures and effects. So the example that's shown here is, I believe it's for like a washing machine that has a sensor to detect if the water's too high and then um, it'll shut off the water once it reaches that. Well, what if you have a washing machine and that sensor fails? What could we do? to actually design in a, you know, a safeguard to mitigate that. So this is going through kind of that process. You rank the, the failures um, on three different things. The severity of that failure, how often it's going to occur, and how you, the detection. So whether or not you can detect it or not. Because if something is very apparent, it's going to pose less risk than some of those failures that you can't see. For example, material failures that may be really difficult to uh, identify in um, the materials that you're looking at. Or it's hidden, you know, so you can't see it. It's not visible uh, that it's going to fail. So um, you do that, and then you calculate the RPN um, which is the risk priority number by multiplying those three um, scores and then develop an action plan. This is again something to be done throughout your design. You have to have something to design to some degree to be able to do a DFMEA, but then you can address this. When you get a list of them, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to fix everything, every failure, but you want to be able to ad um, uh, address the ones that require, that are at the highest risk of causing your project to fail and or ca causing some catastrophic uh, failure at the end. Any questions about this? This is a great design tool, and again, these are one of the things that um, an industry and if you uh, want to present this during your design review, these are tools that are used all of the time um, in industry uh, to be able to identify and mitigate risk. 
And again, too, you can do it on your schedule. Um, what's most likely to fail? What is the thing in my, our project timeline that is most likely going to cause us not to be able to be successful? And actually then either um, dedicate more resources to that early on um, or do some other, bring in extra materials, whatever it might be to be able to address that. One of the other items that we talked about in detailed is user testing. And actually there's data that suggests that, you know, it's kind of a point of diminishing return of how many users that you want to have participate um, in your user study. And so there are a couple of links that go into more of this detail, but really you can get about 80%, identify about 80% of the errors if you test with five users, okay? So if you think about doing your user testing, often we're thinking about maybe one user, you really wanna try and get five users, but you're gonna get 80%. Then if you have the opportunity and make corrections on your project, then you can bring in five more after that. Um, so if you have the ability to bring in more users, it's recommended that you do five initially, make any design changes that you want, and then, um, then do another user testing period with that. Um, one of the things, too, is to try and get as diverse of users as possible, so you can identify as many different errors with that as possible. But there's data and suggestions on how to do that, so. Okay. So one of the mindsets we talked about early on was the design thinking mindset. Now we kind of drew from our experience with the wallet exercise um, to really prototype, to start from a, um, you know, designing from perspective, start with empathy and understand what our users. One of the other mindsets that I think is really um, kind of pervasive especially in epics, is inclusive or universal design. Um, this is motivated by a lot of different factors, and it's not just because we do so many projects for people with disabilities. It's thinking about how can I make what I design as accessible or to, uh, available to the largest market possible. So you can think of it from kind of a marketing point of view. Am I doing things in a way? It is also a little bit influenced by kind of what we do. Um, the Camp Riley team, when we go down to Bradford Woods, um, it is a camp that's highly influenced by universal design. They make the camp so any camper, any kid with a disability can uh, participate in that camp as fully as anybody who's there. All kids can fully participate. Some of the design strategies they do is to not make it so that it um, makes something separate for, for example, people with disabilities. So if you used a wheelchair, where could you sit in this classroom? There's three spots here, right? You can't sit wherever you want. At the camp, they have an amphitheater that you can sit anywhere you want if you use a wheelchair. And actually, all the seats are, they're folded up, and you could either be in a wheelchair or pull a seat down and sit right next to it. So there's no segregated area for people who use wheelchairs. And everybody can access, and it's not only in the back, they can be at any place they want in the amphitheater. So when we think about our designs, not only making it most accessible for everybody, because again, how can the most people use this? Um, can be a really big marketing. And companies have actually leveraged this strategy, the, what, OXO brand of uh, products. Their whole strategy is making their products as accessible as possible. So the principles here, equitable use, flexibility, simple and intuitive, perceptible information, uh, tolerance for error, low physical effort, and size and space and approach and use. 
These are really good design characteristics, though, too, right? Can you think of products that you interact with that violate kind of these universal principles and are frustrating to do? Any? Yes. Yes, absolutely. My Purdue is better, but you should have been here when it started. It was absolutely horrible. I'm not sure they tested it with any users at all. It didn't seem like. Any other? Which ones have, what products have done a good job? Huh? Yeah, yeah, not, not the, met, right. So you can think about it. These are really good design principles, right? They don't really just apply to universal design, but it's an important way of thinking about kind of the mindset um, that we take. So some of the examples that make it more accessible is like making the hand area easier if you would have dexterity issues or grip issues. So a shower head that has a handle the shovel that actually has the circle at the end, um, again, the recliner lever with the circle, those are things that are all easier for people to grip, no matter what, whether they have a disability or not. So those are all things that you can do. Um, size so that you can actually see things, um, you know, making it so uh, if you have trouble reading, if you reach that certain age where small print becomes really difficult, there's so many products out there that are really difficult for average people over 40 to be able to use. Um, blood pressure monitor, um, this is a PT cruiser that's very accessible. So equitable use, again, some of this is like the idea at Camp, at Camp Riley Bradford Woods. Same means for all users, um, you know, where there's ramps, they use a lot of ramps um, because all the users can do that and avoid <coughs> segregating or stigmatizing any users with that. Flexibility, again, being able to accommodate right and left-handed, different user needs. So you might have settings in your software that would allow doing that. Um, your interface to your device could accommodate either a left or right-handed person. So just thinking about how people are actually going to uh, um, interface with that, interact with that. Simple and intuitive. How many people, I mean, you don't, if you get a new product, you don't like reading the user's manual, right? So as much as possible, when you interact with the device, you don't want the kids that go to the imagination station to have to read the manual to figure out how to use your product, right? You want to walk up. You want to play with it. You want to actually just use it. And so how can you communicate important information very clearly to your users so that it's obvious and intuitive how they're going to use it? And that it mat no matter what their maybe experience or knowledge, language skills, um, or maybe concentration level. So eliminate unnecessary complexity with the design. And you want to be consistent with user expectation and tuition. So this is a simple example, but it's a fun one to think about in design. Why do you think it has to be labeled push? Yep, it's a handle, right? So when you get it, see a handle, you usually expect to pull. So when we think about our designs, what do people expect to do when they interact with it and designing them to do that? Because if you have to label push, something's wrong with your design for that. And now you'll walk around campus realizing how many doors violate this. Um, which stovetop is remember, easier to remember which knobs go with what? The top one, right? The white one? So lay out things so that it's really obvious what goes with what. So thinking about how can I communicate to my user without really saying anything what, you know, how to use this um, versus this one you have to remember which one corresponds to what or read the little dots to remember. 
So these are ways you can design your product to make it easier for your users to use. Um, perceptible information, again, fonts large enough. The information that users need to have should be available. And then actually hiding information that's not uh, important for the user to have. The other really big thing about this is feedback. So um, it's important to incorporate feedback into your project. So if the battery goes dead, how are you going to communicate that to your user? They're going to just think it's not working. All it needs is a new battery. Those are things that you want to be able to communicate so that they get kind of feedback. For some people, like for one of the communication devices, the, the haptic, the feedback, is really important for the users to understand that they're actually communicating and actually um, pushing a button. So those are things to really think about doing that. So click indicator lights, comment box. Um, if you have a software program you're writing and it's taking a minute to process, giving the user feedback that it's, you know, the hourglass or the circle or whatever it is to communicate that it actually is working, um, but that you don't have um, that. As much as possible, uh, communicate ways, symbols, things that if people um, use different languages, um, that they can uh, understand what you're trying to communicate to them. Also, the tactile, the braille, vibration, those are also um, things that are really important. We have some teams that are working with the Indiana School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. All of these things are really important for that in audio. Tolerance for error. One of the things that you can do, and your DFMEA can help with this, is that if your user makes a mistake, you want the consequences as minimal as possible. So, um, I don't know about you, but I really appreciate it when Microsoft Word, when I'm getting ready to exit out of a document, and I haven't saved it, and it reminds me, are you sure you want to quit or don't you want to save this before I lose all those changes that I had just made? So those kind of um, feedback are really, or warnings are really important to do that. So the fail-safe features, you can identify a number of those using the DFMEA. Um, again, prevent warning, reverse, recovering, make it impossible or very difficult uh, to um, make the consequences of the error. I mean, this is a simple thing. Um, there's a book called um, Put Phasers on Stun, and it talks about the fact that somebody had designed a medical device where the, the um, connectors for the, um, the fluid, the IV, and the um, electricity were very similar. And they ended up electrocuting a child because they didn't make it impossible to mix those up. And so these are kind of designed, hopefully we're not ever in that space, but making sure people can't hook up that your connectors are standard connectors that people aren't accidentally going to get themselves electrocuted or shocked by plugging something in wrong. Because kids will do things, people will use things wrong all the time. Um, you know, graying out options that aren't available uh, are things that you can do. Consistently, whether you love or hate Microsoft, one of the things that's helpful is that that command bar is pretty similar. I go into a new program that I haven't necessarily used. I at least know some of it. It's laid out in a similar way, so it's easier to navigate. So if you're designing something, think about what are the other maybe uh, products that your users will interact with? What do they expect? How can this align with their expectations related to that? I put the stoplight up there. We had a team that was um, designing basically a game for kids, and um, red meant go, and green meant stop. And it's like, that doesn't align with people's expectations of what you, what these different colors mean. 
So making sure that you understand what those are and kind of being consistent with that. Uh, low physical effort, just another thing. Again, this is really important for all people, but especially um, elderly people with disabilities for that. Um, some redesign projects that it's a lot easier to do. A pool if you're going to go out gambling and to play the slots. Um, if you want to do the, the pull or the buttons a lot easier. Um, you know, saving favorites, ways that people can enter the data, like with uh, UPC codes and stuff. Size and space, regardless of kind of people's size, you just want to be cognizant of that. There's a lot of regulations and guidelines out there for how you should determine size and approach for like devices. Um, ADA guidelines provide a lot. There's also anthropometric data. So this gives the average height of different um, body parts or average length of um, like arms. And so if you're designing for somebody and you want to know how far can they reach, you can look at a chart like this to know what the average um, amount is. One other thing to be careful is, though, that we don't want to just uh, design for the average because then it means that people, 50% of the people may not be able to use our uh, project if we're related to that. But there's data available. If you need to know what's the average height of a five-year-old, can, you can get that data and, and base it on that. There are also scales within this inclusive design that you can actually rate how much dexterity is needed and calculate how, um, how much of the population you're excluding by making, uh, for example, the requirement uh, for vision or hearing to be at a certain level. So there's actually, there's scales here that you can actually use uh, for that. There's also a calculator um, that if you look at this real quick, you can actually go into this um, toolkit and do the calculator and um, enter data, like how it'll tell you which one, for example, that you have to read text at different levels. And then it'll go back and say you have to be able to read or ordinary text. And it will actually calculate if you go through and do all of these, it can tell you what percent of, uh, of the population isn't going to be able to use your product when you get done with that. So there are ways to actually quantify what we do with this. Um, just real quick, I'm almost done, but don't move yet. Delivery phase. So um, one of the things just to be aware of, if you're planning on delivering this uh, semester, we do have a few. There's some, you know, how the thought, the thing to be thinking about with delivery is, how can my users be successful once I deliver this project? What kind of support, user manuals, training might they need? And making sure that you're thinking about that. It's not just getting it done and showing it works in the lab. That doesn't always make for a successful project. So what else might you do? We have a checklist that we have um, that you can go through to make sure you're kind of covering basic things like, um, you know, is it identified as an EPICS project? There are reasons we have some of these things um, in place. But anyway, work with your advisors if you have a project that you're wanting to deliver. And then also, kind of we, since we have long-term partnerships, we also do the service and maintenance. And sometimes it's retirement or redesign of our projects. So, okay. Hold on just one second. Almost done. So for next week, we're going to be talking about ethics. And you need to complete the ethics survey before you come to class because we're going to talk about it. And so here's the link. It's on the little piece of paper. The other place that it is, if you go to SharePoint, 
right here. There's the link, so you don't have to copy in that really kind of cryptic link from Qualtrics. All right, that's it. Have a great week. And I will also.